In order for me to talk about grace, I need to address one lingering problem that you and I have. And it is the problem of sin. But before I can even talk about the problem of sin, I have to talk about my perfect God that created everything in perfection. You see, in Genesis chapter 1, the story begins seven times telling me that God saw, he looked, and it was good. And on the seventh time, on the seventh day, on the sixth day, at the end of the sixth day, when everything was created and the Sabbath hour was about to approach, God reviewed one more time, and Scripture says that it was what? Very good. So then what happened? Why would sin enter a very good place? How come you and I are now filled and covered and surrounded by this thing called sin? Well, Jesus tells us a parable in Matthew chapter 13. Anyone familiar with that parable? Yes, there's a famous parable. There, uh, this master goes down and he plants what type of seed? Bad, good, or so-so seed? Good seed. He plants good seed, but what happens in the middle of the night? What does scripture tell us? Someone comes in and plants bad seed, and then the servants go out and say, Hey, master, I thought that you planted good seed in your field. And what does the, ma the master say? An enemy, what? Has done this. An enemy has initiated a plan, a process of corruption. So how... How can I overcome this destruction that Satan has entered into my life, that has entered into your life? He has actually done a wonderful job in destroying the future that God has for you. He has done such a great job that there is an old lady by the name Ellen White. She says, she tells us that the lies of Satan are so good that only scripture can distinguish truth from error. Not even yourself, not even your logic, not even your reasoning is good enough to understand the sophistication of the lie. We talked in Sabbath school class this morning about the great controversy, and I'm, I was actually, I did not intend it to be that way. I actually, this sermon has been planned for about uh, two or three months already. So I knew the sermon was coming. I really wasn't sure where the Sabbath school was going to go, and it's fascinating to see how the spirit was leading this morning because the reality is and you're going to see this shortly sin is so bad and we sometimes can't see it sin is so bad that he has blinded you and me of our present condition sin is so heinous sin is so terrible that it actually does something in you that you, don't, you yourself cannot even, you're not even aware of what sin is doing. So let's turn to the book of Romans. Let's turn to the book of Romans. We're going to stay in Romans. I do have some Bible verses on, uh, on the screen, but it's not all of them. We're going to have some, a, a nice reading here, okay? So it's a little old school Bible study we're having right now. Amen. Anyone want, like one of those? Okay. So I, I know I'm a preacher. I know I, lo I love to preach, but I I'm a Bible student first. I like to study the Bible. So we're going to go through scripture here. Romans chapter 1. Let's start in verse 16. I hear some pages and I love the crinkling of the pages. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is what? What is it? It is the power of God for what? For salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The what? The just shall live by faith. Verse 18 here. For the wrath of God 
is revealed. Now notice, the righteousness of God has been revealed, and right now the wrath of God is revealed. Why? You may ask, why is it revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteous men? Why is it, Paul? He says that their unrighteousness is suppressing the truth. Y'all hear that? The reason why God's righteousness is show, has shown and demonstrated itself all over. We have seen the goodness of God through and through, okay? Anyone has seen God's goodness? You woke up this morning, amen? That's God's goodness right there. But God's wrath is being demonstrated right now because what we are seeing, and this is Paul talking in his day. How much more will he say about today? He's saying that people are suppressing the truth. Verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly, what? Perceived. It's been seen. We know this. Our scientists, astronomers, people that deal with all these big things, they see, they handle the gift that God has given us. But yet, because of sin, we suppress the truth. And that's not their problem alone, that's our problem. So let's keep reading. Verse 20. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, having been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. Y'all listening out there? What was one of the things, what was one of the, the issues that the uh, unrighteous people do? They don't give what? Thanks. Maybe we should be a little bit more thankful in our life, amen? Maybe when, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Mrs. gets you a drink, perhaps stop and say, you know what, darling, thank you. You didn't have to do that. Thank you. Or when the kids show up, you know, Jeremiah loves doing this, Elena loves doing this too, where they go out and they, uh, you know, bring the shoes out of nowhere. Oh, here, here you go, Papa. Thank you. You didn't have to do that. But thank you. Gratefulness, thankfulness, it's, 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 it's a big thing. But Paul can keep saying this, that they were not thankful. For although they knew God, they did not honor him and, or uh, give God, um, I'm sorry, honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became what? Futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things, right? We call this and we say, oh, that's idolatry. Yes, the world is committing idolatry, and I will say amen to that. The world has committed idolatry. But now this is where I want to lead you to this next verse. Verse 24. Therefore, God gave them up. I don't think we understand the force of that statement. For this reason, God gave them up. In your sheet, in your little worksheet, you, you'll see it there. There are two important promises that God is making. He doesn't claim it outright, but he, this is a promise that you can find in Scripture. And the first one is that God puts at bay your passions. Y'all hear me, church? You can be worse than what you are right now, but God is keeping you safe. You can become, and I am going to go that far, you can become the next Hitler in human history, but God is keeping you at bay. It is God's grace that's restraining you from going the full length of your sin. And many times we go through our life and we think, oh, boohoo me, but we don't realize the power, the constraining power of the love of Christ that holds me back from becoming the full despicable person that I should be because of sin. Paul tells me, 
He's telling us right here. Therefore, God gave them up in their lusts of their hearts to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, verse 26, God gave them up to dishonorable things. The first truth that you need to remember about the grace of God is that it's holding you back from the full extent of your sin. But this is not it. We're talking about pagans, right? Oh, the pagans, pagans, the worldly people are worshiping created things. It's, all, it's them outside of the church that we need to worry about. We're fine in here. Well, Paul turns into chapter 2. Let's turn to chapter 2 now. <coughs> chapter 2, verse 17. What does Paul now say? But if you call yourself what? A Jew. Chapter 2, verse 17. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you instruct, you are instructed from the law. Some of us are like, oh yeah, it's not talking about me, that's a Jew. But let me ask you, church. Don't you know the law of God? Aren't you to be the one who teaches people about the Sabbath? Aren't you the one that's supposed to teach about people about the second coming? Aren't you the one that should te- that's supposed to be teaching about what it is to live a healthful life? It's talking about you. Romans chapter 2, verse 17. Paul is talking about you and me in the pew. Right, Paul tells us that the Jew is not the one who is the Jew outwardly. It's what? The one who's inwardly, whose heart is circumcised by Christ. That's you and I. Paul has an issue with us now. Chapter 1, yes, praise the Lord, yes, he has an issue with those outside. Yes, they're pagans, they worship idolatry, they do all this and all these terrible things, all those sins of the flesh, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? We have children, so I want to be a little bit discreet. You all understand what I'm saying, right? We like to point those sins out. But now, chapter 2, Paul has an issue with us because he says now, but you who call yourself a Jew, a Christ follower, a person who keeps the law from head to toe, you know the Ten Commandments, you know what God wants from you, and you tell people, I am a Sabbath keeper, you are a first day worshiper, right? We do this. We may not say it in that tone, but we do say it anyways. But yet here Paul says, okay, you who call yourself a Jew, who knows the law, verse 19, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge of, in truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? Do you fail to live up to the same standard that you try to hold others to? You who say, oh, that's sin, do you not hold yourself accountable as well? Paul has some some issues. While you preach against stealing, do you steal? No, pastor, I don't steal. No, I have to go there because it's just, it's there for the taking now. What does Malachi tell us? You have robbed me. What, what, what have we robbed you in, God? Tithes and offering. Now, we always jump to the money part. But have you been giving God of your time? Have you been giving God of your health? Have you been giving God a time in your family? Have you been consistent and balanced as a Christian all throughout your life? And the answer is no, then you have robbed me. You who say, verse 22, you who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Come on, church. Oh, my goodness. I can preach on this one now. What's on your screen? When you're by yourself, what are you thinking about? And I'm going to go there. 
When you're in church, where does your eye wander? Come on now. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Does your hand stay where it should be? Does your mind stay on pure things or does it wander off? Paul's talking about adultery and Jesus tells us that adultery is not the one that, it's not just simply the act of engagement. It's the thought. Where's your mind? Is it in heavenly things or is it of wandering around in the creatures of God? Sin. That's how dangerous sin is. That it can make you feel that you are safe in your pew because you're in God's house. You're saying amen when the preacher says good things. You give your tithe, you give your offering, you come and you do all these great things. But sin has you deceived thinking that you can harbor this one thing that no one else knows. And it makes you feel comfortable in that sin. That's what Paul is talking about here. Verse 23, you who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it has been written, the name of God is what? Blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. These are not my words, church. Paul is saying that about us. I'm included in this too. You know, the second promise that God makes, not only does he withhold and restrain the passions, but he also checks my pride and my ego. He keeps me at bay. He reminds me I am just like the other person too, in need of a savior, in need of the same grace they need. God is making sure that, yes, my passions are in check at all times, because if not, then I'm just going to, you know... (laughs) There's no future for me. But at the same time, God is saying, okay, I'm working with you, but I don't want you to get too big-headed now. Don't think that it's because of you that you can keep yourself pure. No, 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 no. I'm the one that keeps it in check. Don't forget about who's doing the work. I'm doing the work for you, not you yourself. You know what God does when we begin to get a little high, you know, know, we, we get a little bit too boastful about our saintliness? Come on, I've heard the prayers. Oh, pastor, I have, not, I have not sinned in years. Come on, I've heard that in church. I've heard people say, I, it's been 17 years since I have committed a sin. I was like, wow. It's time to start the record again, man. You're, you're boasting at me. I'm proud. What are you doing? <laughs> It happens. But by God's grace, he keeps that in check too. The love of Christ constrains us. Yes, it it compels us to do good things, but it constrains us. It, It holds us back from being the worst version of ourselves. You might be saying, Pastor, this is very negative. Like, if there is there no is there no possibility of freedom for me now, Pastor? Right? You know, because it's, but the reality is that if you have no Christ, I'm, I'm still into my thunder right now. If you have no Christ, there's no freedom for you. You're destined to one de- direction, one destiny. It doesn't matter how much you try. You may say, I'm choosing this, I'm choosing that. But the end result, if you have no Christ, you're heading to one place and one place only. And it's death. That's it. You only have one choice if you have no Christ. But if you have Christ... Now the possibility of life is open. Now you can choose to move on a different course and say, I'm choosing life. I'm not choosing death. But let's look. Chapter 6. Let's turn to chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. I told you we're doing here a little uh, Bible study here. Romans chapter 6, verse 15. What then? What then, pastor? Are we to sin? Because we're not under the law, but under grace? I hear this all the time. Well, pastor, that's a good thing. God's grace is covering everything. So that means I can live the way I want to, and God forgives me. What does Paul say? 
God forbid, and if you're a fan of the Hebrew, make anointing. Absolutely not. It's ludicrous. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are what? Slaves, servants of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. And this is the truth about sin that I wanted to share with you, church. You see, the reality now that we are facing, something that we need to realize in our life, is that we are slaves of someone. We are slaves of someone. You're either a slave to sin or a slave to Christ. And last time I checked, when you look in our, in our history, in our human history, when a slave was a slave, they had no choice of their own. You may, you may want to be free. You may desire to have a free life. But who's your master? Sin reigns and has a tight grip over his slaves. And there is nothing you can do. There is nothing you can think. There is nothing you can say. There is nothing in the world that is within you that can change the reality that you are a slave to sin. Paul goes on in chapter 7. He even says in chapter 7, <clears throat> verse, oops, went the wrong way. In chapter 7, verse 7, what then shall we say? The law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what, is, what, it, what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came, came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. Verse 12, he says now, so the law is holy and the commandment holy, righteous, and good. So verse 13. And I don't want you all to miss the point because here is the power that I want to share with you today. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. Did y'all hear what Paul is saying here? We are so deep in our slavery to sin that God had to introduce a way, a means for us to realize how lost we are. And if it wasn't for God's grace to sending the law to show us that we are incapable of choosing a better life, we would have remained in that slavery. But this law can't save us. In order for a slave to be free, two things need to happen, one or the other. The law needs to change, or sadly the slave dies, and then he technically is free. Y'all with me, church? I hope you're understanding what I'm saying. In order for a sinner that is 
bounded to sin to be free. The law must be changed. Or the other alternative is for the slave to die and no longer be under the power of sin. But we know that the law can't change. The law is eternal. Jesus himself came and died to make sure that the law does not change. So that means... that the sinner has to die. That means that your only way out is through death. And that is exactly what Paul is trying to get to. There is no future for a sinner (laughs) except sinning. But if a sinner chooses to lay their life in the hands of Jesus. If a sinner says, I want to die with my Christ. If a sinner says, I will be nailed on the cross with my Jesus. When a sinner says, I will be buried in the watery tombs of baptism with my Jesus. Then that sinner has a future. Then that sinner has a possibility To say, I am free from my taxing slave master. I am no longer bound by sin anymore. He has no dominion or control over me. My God is my master now. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 8, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. You and I must embrace the sacrifice of our sinful nature. That's what uh, old school uh, um, Christians have always called the mortification of sin. Anyone heard that term before? Maybe some of y'all are like, oh, wow, that's a term I have not heard in years. The mortification of sin, the killing of the flesh, it has to be killed. It has to be axed. Because it's the only way that you and I can be free and live the life of life that Christ has for us. But not just that, let's keep reading. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, because of sin, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that what? Church, read that out loud with me. In order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us. Church, you want to keep the Ten Commandments? Woo. Wow. Okay, let me try this one more time. Let's reverse this. That was kind of scary. Church, do you want to keep the Ten Commandments? Do you want to keep the Sabbath holy? Do you want to keep God's name out of your mouth in vain, right? You don't want that happen to happen, amen? You want to keep God first in your life. You want to not make sure that you don't commit idolatry. You want to honor your parents. You want to uh, be faithful to your spouse. You don't want to uh, say lies. You don't want to kill. You don't want to steal. You don't want to uh, uh, um, lie and give false testimonies. Or worst of all, be a covetous person. Then Paul is telling you and me that we need to die to self. You can't keep the Ten Commandments under the rulership of sin. Sin will not allow you to. Sin will not let you go. But you need to choose death. You must lay your life down. You must say, Christ, I want to die with you. You need to say, Christ, I want to join you in the watery grave. There are some of us here in this church that need to make that decision for the first time, others for a second time. 
Because the only solution, church, I, I, I want to, you know, I came here and I made, you know, we, we talked about wonderful things that we can do, but in order for us to achieve what God wants us to achieve here in this church, church, we need to understand that we can't do it under the bondage of sin anymore. We need to be free. I'm not talking about being perfect all the time. That's not, I'm, not, I'm not even thinking about that at this point. I'm just simply saying, will you say, will you lay down your selfish life and say, Christ, I want your life? Because Paul tells me, in order for the righteous requirements of the law to be fulfilled in me, I need to lay down my life and pick up Christ's life. Who walk not according to, what's the word? To the flesh, but according to the spirit. Psalm 51 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You see, it's our belief at Seventh-day Adventist that we are created in the image of God, but that image has been marred. It has been destroyed because of sin, because we are slaves to sin. But it is God's mission to reconcile us, to create in us a clean heart, to give us a new spirit, to restore in penitent mortals the image of their maker.